All right, good morning, everybody. It's uh, 10 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Ben Morris. I'm the Communications Director here at the Oregon Secretary of State's office, and we are here today to release a new audit report on the implementation of Measure 101, Measure 110, excuse me. A uh, couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, our agenda for today is pretty simple. Um, we're going to hear some introductory remarks from Secretary Fagan. Then we'll pass it over to our audits director, Kip Mehmet. And uh, finally, we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, if you'd like to record this meeting on your computer, uh, let me know in the chat. And uh, as soon as I'm done talking, I will uh, share recording privileges with you so you can get that started. Uh, we'll do Q&A at the end, uh, and we do that through the hand raise feature in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom, there is a button at the bottom of the main screen that looks like a smiley face. Uh, it's called reactions. If you click on that, you can then click on a little thing to raise your hand. And we'll use that to take questions at the end, and we'll just go in the order that we receive them. We should be able to get to anyone's, everyone's question. We have plenty of time for questions today. Uh, lastly, I just want to ask everyone to stay on mute when you are not talking. That'll make it easier for all of us to get uh, good audio out of the recording. So those are my housekeeping items. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Secretary Fagan to get us started. Thanks, Ben. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shamia Fagan, she, her pronouns, and it's my honor to serve as Oregon's Secretary of State. Thanks for joining us today for the release of a real-time audit of the implementation of Measure 110. I was one of the strong majority of Oregon voters who voted for Measure 110 because the status quo had failed my family and people who I love. Measure 110 passed because it created the expectation that more people struggling with addiction would have access to treatment. And I know that many of you have heard me tell uh, stories about my family members. I've been open with the struggles that my family faced during my childhood. In 2009, I was just about to finish my third year of law school. I was on winter break when I received a phone call from my mom's boss at the Glass House Tavern at 97th and Sandy that my mom was in the ICU at Portland Adventist because she had overdosed on some lethal combination of opioids and methadone um, when she had been uh, partying with her husband the night before. Her husband and the friend they were using with was afraid of getting in trouble, so they had not called anybody. And by a happenstance of another family member stopping by that morning, my mom was able to be rushed to the ICU at Portland Adventist Hospital and, and saved her life. And so this is very personal for me. And thankfully, that time my mom had been in and out of treatment a number of times in my life. But that time, my brothers and I helped her move to Pendleton and supported her for about a year while she tried to go to community college, learn some new skills and get a different type of job. And when she passed away in October of 2014, she had been clean for almost six years and living in the first house she'd ever owned out in Umatilla. And so as you can see, the audit we're releasing today is very personal to me. My older brother right now is still in treatment and enjoying support from the Oxford House Network. And so like most Oregonians, I am dissatisfied by our failing drug treatment system. Those of us who are personally impacted by family members are more than dissatisfied, we're angry. And make no mistake, this is a matter of life and death. Measure 110 must work because real people's lives hang in the balance. And as I've said many times, my mission as Oregon's Secretary of State is to build trust between the people of Oregon and their state government so that Oregon's public services can make a positive difference in people's everyday lives. And the audit is one of the most powerful tools we have to fulfill that mission by offering changes to Measure 110 to fulfill its promise to Oregonians. When Oregonians passed Measure 110, we expected that our loved ones battling addiction would have access to treatment and chance for a better life. We expected there would be fewer of our neighbors struggling on the streets. That is the promise of Measure 110. This audit offers a roadmap to the Oregon Health Authority that they can pursue to fulfill that promise and make our communities and our families safer and healthier. Look, in the two years since Measure 110 passed, drug misuse in Oregon has only gotten worse. Some have been quick to call Measure 110 a failure. I believe that's a mistake. 
Remember that before Measure 110 passed, the status quo had failed people with addiction in Oregon for over 50 years. The Oregon Health Authority needs to make changes to put the program in a position to succeed for Oregonians. This audit gives OHA that roadmap, a roadmap to build a better grants program and get more money into effective treatment services for Oregonians. To do that, OHA must give the grants program more support, capture good data to evaluate the program, and reduce fragmentation. OHA must also collaborate with other groups who are serving Oregonians within that same space. This audit includes specific actionable steps that OHA can take to accomplish these goals. In addition, the Oversight and Accountability Council that was created by Measure 110 should increase its collaboration with the Oregon Department of Corrections around treatment programs for adults in custody. Addiction is a major barrier for many adults in custody who are trying to turn their lives around. And without collaboration, Oregon will struggle to achieve one of the core goals of Measure 110, righting the wrongs of the past war on drugs. And before I conclude my remarks, I wanna make sure that we do talk about the war on drugs and we can't talk about the war on drugs without talking about the racist history of the war on drugs in Oregon and around the country. When you read this audit, please don't skip past the history section. When you report on this audit, please do not skip past the history section. For decades, Oregon's drug laws disproportionately harm communities of color. The decisions we make today must take that context into account or else we won't be able to right the wrongs of our past. I wanna thank the Audits Division for its focus on including that racist history of the war on drugs that was included in this audit. As our state's chief auditor, I will use the Audits Division to build trust by holding our leaders accountable if they fail to address our most urgent problems. As I said, this audit is personal to me. I am very dissatisfied by Oregon's failing drug treatment system, and it's a matter of life and death I'm urging the Oregon Health Authority to quickly implement the recommendations in the audit to make Measure 110 a success story. The Audits Division has truly done some incredible work that can make a real difference in people's lives. I wanna thank them again for the high standards and professionalism they put into this audit and every audit that they do. With that, I'd like to introduce Kip Mehmet, the Director of the Oregon Audits Division. Secretary Fagan, thank you so much for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Kip Mehmet, Audit Director with the Secretary of State's uh, Office. We want to really thank the Secretary for her comments, sharing her personal story and her motivation, and just for her tremendous support of the Audits Division. And I want to thank all members of the media for your interest in this important report, this real time audit, as we call it, of the Measure 110 program. It's obviously a high stakes program, as the Secretary just laid out. Um, and just to reiterate, really, our message is pretty simple. It's too early to tell. You know, there's been some narratives that this has been a failure as the secretary covered and so forth. And, you know, from an audit perspective and a, and a, and a government performance measurement perspective, we haven't got there yet. So the key of this real time audit is really showing how we can we, we got off to a rough start. Some of this ballot uh, government by ballot initiative causes some problems and it takes time to structure government properly, which can be frustrating. But, you know, auditors, we, we talk. A little bit wonky about controls and governance and outcome measures, but you really have to have those in place to, to assess performance. And so this real-time audit, as the Secretary just said, has some real recommendations that we can start designing the evaluation and outcome part of this program so we can measure to see if it's affecting and, and providing those services. And we can also provide ultimate transparency around it, including the use of those funds and make sure you know whether they're effective or not, we know where they're going. So again, appreciate the secretary. Our office is gonna to continue to do audit work in this program. Uh, we're required by statute, so we'll have upcoming real-time audits on this as well. Having said that, I just wanna introduce and thank the team, Ian Green and Casey Kopcho. Ben, I'll turn it back over to you to facilitate the question and answer so session. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kip. And thank you, Secretary. Uh, so at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Um, go ahead and use the raise your hand feature in Zoom to uh, queue up and we'll take them as they come. All right, uh, the first question I'm seeing is from Ben at the Capitol Chronicle. Ben, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, Given that you say we need more time to see if it's successful, uh, assuming the recommendations are followed, how much time would it take to then see if, if the measure is, is working the way it's supposed to? 
Thanks. Ian Green, Audit Manager for the Oregon Secretary of State Audits Division. I, I think that's a really complex question. You know, one challenge right now that we highlight in the audit report is that the Oregon Health Authority and the Oversight and Accountability Council are not collecting sufficient data to answer the question if the program's working. So really it starts with collecting that data and giving enough time to, to uh, collect all that data from the various providers and the behavioral uh, uh, resource networks around the state. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ben, for your question. Uh, next hand I saw was Nigel with the Warrant Week. Nigel, go ahead. Uh, Kip or Ian, I'm uh, curious. There's been a lot of reporting on 110 already. I'm curious what the audit team found that was surprising to the audit team or to, or to Kip. Kip, do you want to take that? First? I'll take a quick stab at it first. Thank you for that good question. You know, I wouldn't say it's surprising, but a little bit. Um, as I said, my opening comment is predictable. You know, um, to to uh, to not really one of the key things we put out in the audit is to delineate, if I can say that word, the roles and responsibilities between our Oregon Health Authority that have a lot of uh, experience and and uh, know how and power on how to administer these kind of grants and the OAC who are a bunch of uh, really good people with a lot of experience but just don't have that government experience so for us a little bit surprised ever so respectfully of OHA leadership because remembering we were in a pandemic at the time this was implemented but it was a little bit of of um of handoffish and and deferring to a group that really didn't have the ability to know where they were supposed to be going and so we lost a lot of time there and so it while it's not surprising it's it's a little disappointing and a little bit predictable so again not just with this audit but a but a big uh, strategy out of the audit division is to start seeing those programs that are being put in by the state and i won't belabor that now we could list a whole bunch of audits we've already done that of saying hey look we're implementing major programs we need to get the control structures in place we need to get the accountability in place before we start um rolling down the the, the, the hill with the program and making promises um, i know there's an expectation on this program for quick delivery every day someone is not treated for drug um, disorder is a day that they're struggling and so we get the urgency, and that was a good question by the first um, reporter as well. Um, we can't answer that, as Ian said, distinctly of it'll be this amount of time, but we will be on it from our office, measuring these controls where they're being in and what the uh, um, output is. Ian, can you add a little bit from the team who dug really deep into this, what surprises you? Uh, absolutely. You know, I think having challenges implementing a first in the nation program, that wasn't surprising to us. Uh, but one of the really surprising, in fact, impactful stories to me is when we went and we visited Coffee Creek Correctional Facility up in Wilsonville. Um, and, th and that's the state's women's facility. And we went there to see the alternative incarceration program, which is an intensive residential 24 seven drug treatment program for adults in custody. And it was just very surprising to see the level of support and the programs um, that are provided to those inmates. But what was surprising to me was how few of them got access to that treatment. We've got over 12,000 adults in custody um, at the Department of Corrections, over 7,700 currently have significant substance use disorders, and only a few hundred each year are getting access to these intensive treatment programs. And we have a, a great highlight in the audit report around that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next chat I saw was from Annette Newell. Annette, go ahead. Hi, you were mentioning some of the roadblocks and why it's a challenge to implement this uh, as a first in the nation. Uh, that first time we've really tried to do this in the nation. Can you comment about what exactly needs to be done to remove those roadblocks and get some traction um, moving forward? Um, I noticed that a lot of the, the goals were only partially met or not met that the auditors found. Um, and do we have the resources as a state to handle the scope of this problem? Thanks for the question. You know, one of the challenges with implementing the program is not enough resources were put into it at the beginning from the Oregon Health Authority. Uh, they really understaffed that. And you saw those challenges last spring 
um, when they were missing deadline after deadline for getting these funds out. Um, in, in terms of our recommendations, we, we make some recommendations both to the Oregon Health Authority and to the legislature around some of those roadblocks. A great example is clarifying the roles and the responsibilities of both the Oregon Health Authority and the Oversight and Accountability Council. Um, an, another one is to give that clear direction from the legislature to the Oregon Health Authority around supporting the Oversight and Accountability Council. Uh, one of the concerns we heard from agency officials is that they didn't feel like they had the statutory authority to provide some proactive support around implementing it because of the independence that was baked in to Measure 110 around empowering um, communities that had been disadvantaged by the war on drugs to make those actual funding decisions. Um, for where these dollars are spent. Thank you, Ian. The next hand I saw was from Lisa uh, Balick. Lisa, go ahead. Good morning. Um, I guess I'm trying to find out, you know, with this audit, I mean, the, the bottom line, it seems, is that the state's sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars. It's been two years coming up next month that 110 went into effect, and the money is not going out to organizations, even organizations that have been around for a long time to get treatment underway. I mean, is there any kind of teeth in this audit to say, get to this now? Thanks for the question, Lisa. You know, a, a lot of money has gone out the door, even when they were implementing the program, about $30 million went out through an access to care grant program. Um, and then uh, the actual Measure 110, of funds to the burns that started to get distributed in June of last year and was completed by September. There are various processes that money is continuing to flow out. Um, so we're only a couple months into when the money has hit the ground um, with the providers um, and we're starting to see services getting delivered now. But why hasn't it gone out? In other words, it, it's been two years and, and there's hundreds of millions of dollars you know, that are allocated and most of that money hasn't gone out to the organizations. I mean, really, I mean, some has, but what's the holdup? And is there yeah. any kind of teeth to get this moving within a certain time frame and to light the fire? Well, I, I think at this point, Lisa, most of the funds have been allocated and are going out to the providers. The, the holdup was um, the Oversight and Accountability Council had developed a request for grant application process, and that was overly complex. It had too many elements that needed to be evaluated, too many reviews that needed to take place before they could make those funding decisions, um, and they didn't have the staff support from the OHA to get to those, review them, make recommendations. So that's what led to months-long delays uh, last year. Secretary Fagan, do you want to weigh in in terms of what's going to happen quickly? Thanks, Lisa. I was actually just looking as you were asking um, to a letter that Governor Kotek sent out to it on January 11th about agency expectations. And she actually included a section on audit accountability. And she talked about how seriously she takes um, audits and how they, she will be holding her agencies to fulfill audit recommendations on time. And so I think that, you know, given that obviously the, the you know, she's a new governor and she's put a, fulfilling audit recommendations as a top priority for her going out to different agencies. She put that in a letter and shared that with us so that she knows, so that we know how seriously that she's gonna make her agencies take our audit recommendations. Thank you. And just to jump in, one last element, Lisa, for you on that good question is we are actively engaged with our legislature. In fact, just today we uh, briefed one legislator, we briefed several of them and talking to them about specific legislative remedies and, and language. And again, we are also going to be participating as non-voting members on a work group that the legislature has put together on this as well. So from our office, of course, the secretary said with her story and how personal this is to her, you know, we can assure the public we are going to be on top of this and pushing as much as our swim lane allows to get this thing uh, to your point, make sure the funds are out, but also to make sure there are controls. So they just, you know, with the pandemic and uh, unemployment and rental assistance and other programs we're auditing, a lot of money went out real quick and there's a lot of risk to that too. So you start to find that balance and get the controls in because once the money goes out, you can't get it back. And so it, it is a balance, but uh, we need to do better and, and our office will be pushing into the space for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, next time I saw was um, Evan Schreiber. Evan, go ahead. 
Yeah, good morning, everyone. Evan Schreiber from K2. I, I want to follow up on um, what uh, Ben uh, had to say in his first question. I know it was a few minutes ago, but asking about the data specifically, because you have Measure 110 advocates and petitioners who would say don't point to the citation data from officers as a measure for success. But then you have uh, critics of the measure who point to overdose data that continues to rise in the state of Oregon. So I ask you, uh, and, and I guess I would ask you, Ian, uh, what what data, what data would show you that it's working? Excellent question, Evan. Uh, as part of Senate Bill 755, which amended Measure 110, there's a variety of performance measures that look at whether the program will be working or not. So I'll get those details to you. But just looking at big picture, um, what was the baseline level of service prior to Measure 110? How did Measure 110 increase access to services? What services are being provided and what are the returns on investments? and outcomes that result from those services. Right now, the Oregon Health Authority has some plans to collect some aggregated data, and we have concerns that that won't be granular enough to answer the questions of whether the program's working or not. I mean, one of the data points that the petitioners in Measure 110 is they didn't want low-level offenders with small possession of, of, of drugs to be sent to jail and have their lives ruined. But we've your audit reveals that we've the data that we've seen from Oregon Department of Corrections that people weren't getting arrested, people weren't in custody for uh, for simple possession of drugs. That there were other offenses on top of that that had them incarcerated. Is is the is the criminal justice aspect uh, working in your opinion, uh, Evan? That's a great question. I th I think it's really challenging when the decriminalization came before the services were actually out there in the community. That was, I think, uh, with twenty twenty hindsight, an area that if we were to do it again, it might have been done differently. I know we spoke to the the court system and the impact to the drug courts was quite immense when they lost that stick to encourage people to seek treatment. Um, so that's certainly a challenge. Um, and, and you're correct to highlight the audit shows that there was nobody in Department of Correction facilities here in Oregon for possession alone. But there are a number of folks in there that are related to their addiction that committed other crimes um, that ended up that they ended up in prison. And one more thing, if I may, and, and this can go to any of you on the audit team, or this can go to Secretary of State Fagan. Uh, so you, you cited the gap analysis from OHSU. We've reported on that as well, that Oregon needs to double its services to meet the need of struggling Oregonians. So based on your audit, what's it going to take? How is the legislature going to make that happen? Is it falling on the legislature to make that happen? Secretary Fagan, do you want to take first stab? Or I can jump in. Right. I mean, again, we're going to stay within the scope of the audit recommendations for this press conference. But the, I mean, obviously, OHA needs to provide more support. Obviously, the grant program was a big priority in this audit. And so, obviously, the legislature funds OHA. And so, the legislature does have a, has a, have a part in the Ways and Means Committee process of asking what the resources are when they're looking at OHA's budget to make sure that this is implemented in the way that actually serves Oregonians. Yeah, and I understand you want to stay within the scope of the audit. The audit cites that gap analysis data from OHSU. So I'm asking, what's it going to take to double those services from your opinion? So we didn't make any forecasts for um, how much that would cost. But I think when you're looking at Measure 110, how much services are being bought with those funds that have already been distributed and getting a good sense of what is the increase in capacity as a, res a direct result of Measure 110 and where does that fit within that gap analysis that's been reported. Thank you, Evan. Um, Thank make you. sure we get a chance to get to every question here. So next hand I saw was Andrew Selsky. Andrew, go ahead. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, Andrew with uh, AP here. How much of a challenge will it be to find licensed people to staff treatment centers? And uh, what can be done to overcome that, uh, that challenge? Andrew, excellent question. That was something we didn't look into detail as part of the audit. But I do know from watching various legislative hearings, 
uh, there is a challenge in both finding people and facilities to provide these services. That's an area the legislature is currently working on, um, uh, but it's it's going to be difficult over the the next few years to to get both the people and the places. And that's why I would point back to that opportunity at the Department of Corrections, providing more services to the adults that are already in custody that have significant substance use disorder is a great opportunity. They're already being housed, they're already being fed. All you need to do is have some providers provide that structured support um, and programs to help them as they transition back to the public. And that's a thank you for the comment there, Ian. And when these people get out of a prison, um, are you confident that there's going to be a support system for continued uh, drug treatment to once they get out uh, as a result of Measure 110? So I, I would encourage you to reach out to the Department of Corrections full, to understand a full scope of their services. I know as part of the alternative incarceration program, there are those holistic services and continuation um, support from the community. I don't know if that extends to all inmates that are released. And, and finally, what grade would you give the program and how it's doing uh, thus far? Interesting question. I, you know, I haven't really thought of it in, in terms of a grade. Um, I, I, it may be a C. Okay, Roger that. Thank you. All right, uh, next hand I see is from Annette. Annette, go ahead. Hi, thanks for letting me have a second question. This one I wanted to direct to Secretary Fagan for a moment. You really shared your story very eloquently, poignantly about your own struggle in your family with, with drug addiction. In light of what we've heard about the, you know, the resources just not being there uh, for a lot of these families, what would your advice be and your words of wisdom based on your own experience in terms of helping people to get what they need uh, for all the families suffering with this issue? Fix it. I mean, really, it is a matter of life and death for people. They need to fix it. Oregonians passed this with the expectation that people would get better, that they would have access to treatment. And, you know, having struggled with a mom who battled addiction my whole life and watching my brother who's clean right now and, and doing well, but it, it's a continual struggle. You know, there's, those services need to be there, particularly when people are ready, are ready. I, I remember when my brother had an experience and I, by the way, I, I checked with him this week to make sure that I could share because his story is a success. He's very proud of where he's at, but you know, it was, he hit rock bottom and he was ready to go to treatment. And, and my other brother and I called all over and just couldn't, and he had, he was a union sheet metal worker. He had good health insurance and he couldn't find an inpatient facility to take him despite the fact that, you know, he had really hit rock bottom. And so, you know, as Ian said, it's a holistic problem. It's obviously making sure the dollars get out the door to the programs that are already established, whether those are out in the community or in the Department of Corrections. But also it's the legislature, as I know that they are, I believe that Representative Nose and Senator Lieber, if I remember correctly, this is a big priority of them in the, in the mental health and services space to make sure that those providers and facilities are there for people, particularly when they are ready to make that step. Um, that's a time when obviously more than ever, those services need to be there. Thanks for the question. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. And I see um, Kendall Bartley has her hand up. Kendall, go ahead. So much. Um, I just want to do a little bit of follow up. Um, I mean, Ian just mentioned that he would rate this program as a C. So I guess um, I'm not directing it towards anyone specifically, but how uh, for taxpayers and people who may be, you know, um, following the press, how would you give them hope that Measure 110 is a success going forward? I'll jump in with that one and kind of qualify the grade. That was a great question, by the way. We prepped for this, but that was when we didn't prep for. But uh, I, I would say, Ian, and I know he would he would go with me. We're talking about the implementation. Um, our audit already says we don't know. We don't know if this, if the design of the program, if these grants are going to get down and help people. And so, so I would say, with a public trust angle is one, they have a right to be concerned. It was off to a rocky implementation. Um, and and we, you know, we've showed and others some of those holes that need to be corrected. And I, I do want to note, there is positive movement. OHA has stepped in and done some things. We met with their new leadership. Um, they are serious. You can look at their response to our audit. They are going to move forward on this. So I think for me, um, 
we can't give any assurance about the efficacy of the program if it's going to work until we can audit it. So we we want to be really clear with our messaging today that we are not grading the program in terms of does it help people. What we can grade through this audit, even though it's arbitrary subjective, is the implementation. And I would actually probably take it a little lower than in and maybe give it about a D because I think there were some public trust angles on that when there's infighting in government. It, it erodes that trust. And so I think maybe we could have a state done better public messaging, but um, but it is what it is. And so I just want to be clear that we're, we'll be able to give you that grade with an audit grade in a in a couple of years when we are, if they put these controls and we're able to assess the program. But thank you for your great question. And, and I want to piggyback on what Kip was saying. And I mean, again, this is not a question that we prepared for. So I don't want the headline to be that we, you know, give it a certain grade, but the, the grade really, if you read the audit is incomplete. Right. It's incomplete. It's not yet doing what it's supposed to do. So if there is a grade, the grade is incomplete. And, you know, to your question, you know, we make solid concrete recommendations. We provide a roadmap. We have a governor who has sent out a, you know, kind of a, um, a letter to all agencies saying we're going to take audit recommendations seriously. We want them implemented on time. And so, you know, that's obviously let's look at the timing in the audit of when the recommendations expect to be followed through. And, you know, and then obviously the governor said she will hold OHA accountable for making those uh, those audit changes. And so we're going to, as Kip said, um, whether it was personal to me or not, we're going to keep on this audit because it's important to Oregonians. Um, but this is something that we're going to be keeping an eye on. And that's the beauty of a real-time audit is we're able to go in when the, when the grade is still incomplete and make sure that it doesn't become a failure. We're able to go in when the grade is incomplete and say, make these changes so this actually does work for Oregon families. Well, that seems like as good a place as any to end. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for jumping on today. Um, if you have any additional follow-up questions, everyone should have uh, my contact information. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we'll either connect you with the audits team or, or help you get what you need to do your reporting. So uh, thanks again. And I'm going to go ahead at this point and end the meeting for everyone. Take care.